Welcome everyone to this presentation. My name is Dr. Silkman and I'm from the Foul Play team. Uh, today I like to talk about um, how the state effectively diffused the importance of item FL. And I'm of course referring to the brief of the plaintiff respondent that, that was released, recently released on May the 27th, 2020. Uh, and this is the state's response to the filing by Kathleen Zona, who is representing Stephen Avery. And I want to uh, just limit um, this presentation to item FL and how the state actually handled um, item FL as presented uh, from Zona's uh, experts. And as we know, item FL is the so-called magic bullet and we all know the history of how item FL was found. Uh, during an interrogation of Brendan Dassey by in investigators Fassbender uh, and Mark Wiegert on the 1st of March, 2006, um, investigator uh, Wiegert became very frustrated uh, during the interrogation session and he directly asked Brendan Dassey who shot her in the head. Uh, Brendan eventually responded by saying, Stephen. Uh, sometime later, investigator Fassbender said, then why didn't you tell us that? To which Brendan replied, because I couldn't think of it. Right, so what we'll do, we'll have a look at how the state had actually handled item FL. Okay. So let's have a look at part B, and that is the circuit court properly exercised its discretion in denying without a hearing Avery's claims related to the 2016 and 2017 scientific testing. Avery's scientific testing related ineffective assistance of trial counsel and newly discovered evidence claims. And remember, um, during this presentation, I'm only really going to be focusing on item FL. I quote, regarding bullet fragment item FL, Avery procured Dr. Lucine Haig, a ballistics expert, to shoot similar 0.22 caliber long rifle bullets through some bone samples. Palinic, then example, then examined both the test bullets and item FL using standard microscopy techniques. Particles consistent with the appearance of bone appeared on the test bullets. He alleged that no particles consistent with bone appeared on item FL. Palinic noted though, that the observations he conducted were not necessarily inclusive of all particle types that may be present. And he could not definitively say what any of the particles were without further testing. Haig opined that bone fragments would have been detected on item FL by the state's forensic expert, William Newhouse, who microscopically examined it before trial. Avery alleged that because no bone fragments were identified in the damaged bullet item FL over the course of his examination at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab and Palinic did not see anything he believed was bone particulate on item FL, the damaged bullet was never fired through Miss Hallbuck's skull. Avery alleged this completely disproved that she was fatally shot in the head. And we can see here Luke Haig, uh, he was a forensic ballistic consultant uh, hired by Kathleen Zona. And as you can see here, uh, he set up a, an experiment whereby he was firing a 0.22 caliber long rifle bullets through uh, scapulas of bovine. And the reason why he chose um, this particular part of bone is that part of the scapula uh, had the same thickness as a human skull. He 
he had fired the bullets into the scapulars and then he recovered the bullets for uh, Dr. Palahniuk to examine. And as we can see here, we've got a high uh, powered microscope image of item FL in which no bone shards were seen or observed. However, what Dr. Palahniuk observed in item FL were shards of wood, uh, a red liquid, uh, presumably paint, uh, some wax, and some cotton fibers. And if we have a look at Hag's uh, exemplar bullet, what we note, or what was noted, was the presence of bone shards in the soft lead. Okay, so let's have a look at the circuit court's decision. Finally, the court noted that Palahniuk's report about his observation of bullet fragment item FL was not as clear cut as Avery claimed. Palahniuk's report indicated that the tests were not completely inclusive of everything that may be present on the bullet, and to do that, a more detailed analysis would be necessary. The report, therefore, did not support Avery's position. The circuit court further noted that all these items were admitted at trial and each was thoroughly contested by defence counsel. The report submitted by Avery are equivocal in their conclusions and do not establish an alternative or alternate interpretation of the evidence. It found that given the totality of evidence submitted at trial and the ambiguous conclusions as stated in the experts' reports, it cannot be said that a reasonable probability exists that a different result would be reached at a new trial based on these reports. And to make it clear, uh, what Dr. Palahniuk had reported was the fact that he didn't know what species of wood uh, the wood shards had come from and that if he had was permitted further analysis, he could actually determine uh, what particular wood source had um, gone into the soft lead of item FL. Okay, so point number two. The circuit court properly rejected Avery's claims related to the DNA testing. The circuit court properly exercised its discretion in denying Avery's newly discovered evidence and ineffective assistance claims related to this testing. Avery failed to meet the first four prongs of the newly discovered evidence test. And I continue. Further, Avery's own motion refutes that this evidence was unknowable at the time of trial. Haig claimed that Newhouse's microscopic examination would have revealed bone particles on bullet fragment item FL during Newhouse's um, examination at the time of trial. Avery now has attempted to recast this as an ineffective assistance claim, but, this, but that is not the argument he made in circuit court, so it is forfeited. Similarly, Dr. Kenneth Olson, the state's trace evidence expert, used the exact same technology and performed the same type of elemental analysis on the charred bone fragments before trial that Palahniuk performed on bullet fragment item FL. Palahniuk just used a newer microscope, but the date the microscope was manufactured doesn't show that the technology used advanced in any material way since Olson's examination in 2005. Uh, Avery could have conducted this type of examination on item FL then. Okay, now the technology obviously existed in 2005 to determine how much DNA was deposited on an item, seeing as the Wisconsin crime lab did so with the evidentiary swabs. This means Avery's key experiment 
holding a key in his hand provides nothing that was unknowable at the time of trial, either because all of Avery's new conclusions were based on comparing the amount of DNA left on the key during his experiment to the amount of DNA the crime lab detected on key swabs. Now, I realized that wasn't directly related to item Mephel, but the next part is. The record conclusively demonstrates that Avery provided, merely provided new expert opinions based on facts available at the time of trial. That is not newly discovered evidence as a matter of law. Okay, finally, Avery's expert reports about bullet fragment item methyl do not support his position that he has completely disproven the state's assertion that the victim's cause of death was being shot twice in the head for two reasons. First, Avery sought to disprove something the state never alleged, that Ida Mathel went through the victim's skull. The state did not rely on the two recovered bullet fragments to show that the victim was shot in the head and never allege that either recovered fragment went through her skull. Showing that bullet item Ethel did not go through bone, therefore would not disprove any part of the state's case, even if that were what Palinik's report actually concluded. The state's forensic anthropologist, Dr. Leslie Eisenberg, and the medical examiner, Dr. Jeffrey Jensen, testified that the cause of Miss Holbach's death was two gunshot wounds to her head. Avery's own forensic anthropologist, Dr. Scott Fairgreave, agreed, agreed with that assessment. But these experts came to that conclusion by examining the bone fragments recovered from Avery's burn pit, not from anything about the recovered bullet fragments. Dr. Eisenberg found skull fragments that showed unnatural openings in two different skull bones, one in the parietal bone and one in the occipital bone. These openings showed internal beveling and x-rays of these unnatural openings showed radiopaque flecks surrounding them that were not bone. She testified that to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, the internal beveling in the left parietal bone and in the occipital bone indicated gunshot or bullet entrance wounds. Dr. Kenneth Olson, the state's trace evidence expert, testified that he conducted an elemental analysis and learned that the flecks around the openings were lead. So as we can see here in the diagrams, these are the cranial bone fragments. They're burnt and they're not complete cranial bone fragments. They're partial bone fragments. But you can see that each cranial bone fragment contained a bevel. And a bevel is an indication of a high velocity bullet going through the skull, into the skull. The cranial bone fragments were x-rayed and you can see the white flecks. Uh, these were shown to be lead. And we know that the victim was shot at least twice in the skull. One, once in the parietal region on the left hand side near your temple and one at the back of the head in the occipital region. I continue. Dr. Jensen confirmed that the bone fragments showed two gunshot entrance wounds to the head, which were the cause of death. No expert found any evidence of an exit wound. None of the experts who testified at trial claimed that bullet fragment item FL or item FFK was used in the fatal shots. What the state submitted about the two bullet fragments and 11 casings recovered from Avery's garage 
was ballistics expert Newhouse's opinion that all 11 casings and bullet fragment item fell were fired from the .22 rifle taken from Avery's residence. The other bullet fragment, item FK, was in too poor a condition to tell whether it was fired from that gun. But Newhouse never opined that either bullet fragment went through bone, let alone that they were the bullets from the fatal shots. He simply said that item FK at least looked like a bullet that had passed through or has struck some harder object than the bullet. But that could be anything. And the state's DNA expert, Sharid Cohen, testified that Hallbuck's DNA was found on item FL, but she never suggested it had a specific tissue source. In other words, it was the skull bone fragments showing bullet holes in them that the state used to prove that the victim was shot twice in the head, not the bullet fragments. Avery has misunderstood why item FL was significant. Item FL was significant because it was both fired from the gun in Avery's bedroom and had Teresa Horbuck's DNA on it, meaning the bullet touched some part of Miss Horbuck's tissue at some point and therefore linked the gun to Miss Horbuck's murder. But contrary to what Avery claims, no one ever said that item FK and item FL were the two bullets fired into Miss Horbuck's skull. Avery made that inferential leap on his own. Jensen said, as explained, that the bone showed two, and I'll continue that in a sec. Uh, this is an image of Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Jensen, uh, and this is William Newhouse, who proved that the rifle uh, that was found in Stephen Avery's bedroom had fired item FL. And Cherie Cohane uh, was the uh, DNA technical unit leader that showed that uh, Teresa Horbach's DNA uh, was isolated from item FL. And if I can continue. Two gunshot wounds. He said nothing about item FK or item FL going through the skull, nor did the prosecutor. Indeed, the prosecutor told the jury that he could not say how many times Avery shot Miss Holbach and never suggested that the state had identified all the places on her body she may have been shot because only two bullet fragments but 11 cartridge casings were re recovered. But the evidence showed that she was shot at least twice and it's at least twice to the head. But again, that was because the forensic anthropologist and medical examiner found two gunshot entrance wounds in her head, in her skull bones. Had no bullet fragments been found at all, the state's argument about the cause of death being two gunshots to the head would have remained the same. Accordingly, even if Palinik's report about whether bone particles were present on Ida Mephel were as conclusive as Avery represents, Avery would have disproven nothing. Second, as the circuit court noted, Palinik admitted that he could not state with certainty that his observations were inconclusive of all types of particles that may be on Ida Mephel, and further admitted that he could not say with certainty what any of the particles on any bullet exemplar or item of fell was without further scientific testing. Putting Palinik on the stand to say that he could not state with certainty anything about the absence or presence of bone on a bullet fragment that the state never alleged went through bone anyway would not would not create a reasonable probability of a different result at trial. In sum, 
Avery's allegations did not meet any part of the test for newly discovered evidence and accordingly failed to meet the test for prejudice on his ineffective assistance claims. As well, the circuit court appropriately exercised its discretion in denying his motion. And here's an excerpt from Ken Kratz's book. And in his book, he says, and I quote, there's just one problem. The state's actual trial theory was that Ida Mathil, the bullet containing Theresa Horbach's DNA, passed through soft tissue, not bone. And therefore, the fact that no bone was found on it refutes exactly nothing. I should know it was my theory. Nowhere in almost seven weeks of trial transcripts will you find me claiming that Ida Mathel was the bullet that caused either of the two entrance wounds found by Dr. Eisenberg. When examining fragments of Teresa's skull, just because the state found two bullet fragments and two entrance wounds does not mean that pair of findings is in any way related. To advance a headshot theory for those bullets, we would also have needed to uncover evidence of exit wounds in other skull fragments. None were found. So as you can see here, Dr. Palenek, he showed that uh, Ida Mathel contained no uh, bone shards, but it contained wooden fragments. And uh, he told Kathleen Zellner that he would have to do extra research to determine what uh, wood species uh, was present uh, as shards in item FL. Point number three, or section number three, Avery's arguments do not persuade. Regarding item FL, Palenik only said he couldn't see anything that looked like bone on bullet fragment item FL but further analytical approaches would be needed to more specifically confirm its absence. That is exactly what the circuit court said, Palenik said, and it is far from the definitive conclusion Avery claims. Avery's, um, uh, my apologies, but again, while it's true that the state's theory as to the cause of death was gunshots to Miss Holbuck's skull, neither the state nor any of the state's experts ever alleged that Ida Mathel was one of the bullets that went through her skull. Avery just jumped to that conclusion. Palinek's examination therefore disproves nothing. No matter what conclusion he reached about the particles on Ida Mathel, uh, and the rest of the section uh, has to do with the uh, burn pit uh, and uh, I'll, I won't necessarily go through that. All right guys, so if we have a look at the filing uh, that was submitted, here's the ultimate conclusion that uh, both Cole and Kumfer had come up with and that is, though Avery raised a litany of claims in his motions, None of them entitled him to a hearing. The circuit court properly exercised its discretion to deny his motions without one. This court should affirm the circuit court. So if I can just state my own conclusion, uh, basically what the state did in regards to Ida Mathel is they ignored it. They ignored all the findings that were done by Kathleen Zellner's experts. And the reason why they ignored it is because Ken Kratz never claimed that uh, item FL or item FK uh, struck bone and went through Teresa Horbach's skull. So as a consequence, um, they have completely ignored the findings of Kathleen Zellner's experts. But what is disingenuous here is that if you actually follow the trial transcripts, there was a very strong impression that uh, the uh, defense, uh, not the defense, 
uh, the attorneys for the state were giving in regards to Ida Merfell. And they constantly mention the fact that two bullet fragments were found, two cranial bone fragments were found with um, beveling, indicative of a high velocity round, and they got the medical examiner to state that the cause of death was due to uh, bullets striking uh, Teresa Horbach's skull. But yes, because um, the state never mentioned the fact that item FL or item FK had actually struck Teresa Horbach in the skull, um, they've completely ignored uh, everything in regards to item FL that Kathleen Zellner's uh, experts have produced. So, as you can see here, Kathleen Zona has until June the 11th to file her reply uh, to the state. And unfortunately, uh, at this time, uh, Stephen Avery continues to be in prison. So um, it is my belief that uh, Kathleen Zona's next move uh, in regards to answering the criticism uh, by the state is going to be a very, very important one. And we're all looking forward to that. Look, guys, thank you very much. My name is Dr. Silkman, and I'm from the Foul Play team. Uh, please join us uh, on our YouTube channel, and you can see the link down below, uh, where we discuss many different aspects of the case. Uh, we also do uh, case readings. Uh, we have the uh, Powder Puff team, who looks at uh, a lot of social injustices, uh, not only in the Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey cases, but throughout other cases as well. And if you would like to read the document, uh, the state's document or reply to Kathleen Zellner's filing, you can see the link down below. It's 130 pages. Thank you very much, guys. Catch you later.